the Bible, you should have it nearby at all times. At all times. So if you can, please open up to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. And we're going to go to chapter 2. And while you're turning there, let me go ahead and uh, see if I can get something to clear my throat real quick. Nehemiah chapter 2. That's in your Old Testament. If you want, you can check the table, con uh, the, the table contents in the front of your Bible, and that'll help you find it. That's before the book of Psalms, uh, Job, before the book of Job, after the first and second chronicles. See, 
This church, not physically, but spiritually, is a dividing wall from us and the lost world. And the moment the lost world starts to get in here and, and make the church act like it's lost, all right, we fail. But here's the thing is you can't just keep the lost world out all the time. That's why it has gates. See, a gate is designed, a door is designed to let something come through. See, that's why we bring lost people to church so that they can get saved. But when we start bringing lost people in for the sake of having them fill up seats and not to give them the gospel, guess what? Now you've introduced apostasy and wrong doctrine and, and, and uh, lukewarmness to the church. So you need to have the walls and you need to have the gates. You need to know how to let them in, but you need to know how to keep them at a distance. And that's what happened in Jerusalem. The walls were burned down. There is no longer a division between God's people and the lost world. And there needs to be division for, the, for this whole thing to make sense. So in chapter 1, he prayed for that. In chapter 2, Nehemiah, verses 1 to 10, he was given an opportunity by divine providence. You see, when God wants to start a Bible-believing work, he's going to give a Bible-believing man a burden, and he's going to give him an opportunity. Okay? God will always pave a way for you to succeed if he's called you to it. Oftentimes, there's many men that have not been called by God, but they've called themselves. See? And you know who those people are. The John MacArthur's called themselves. You see, these guys like Benny Hinn called themselves. You see, these guys like Joel Osteen called themselves. Joyce Myers called themselves. You see, these people, they're not being, they're not following the Bible. They're following the dollar signs. That's what they're about. See, some of these, some, some of these guys might even mean well, but God never called them. See, you, need, you better be sure that God has called you to where you're at. See, God would never call you to a place where he would not be fed the word of God. He wouldn't call you there. See, he might call you to start a work there, but you need to be fed first. All right? God will call a man. God will call a man. He doesn't call a woman to start a church. All right? He doesn't call that. The Joyce Myers of this world, the Bible says God would not suffer a woman to be a, 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 have authority over the man. He's, he's called a man here, be in mind. And in chapter 2, He's called Nehemiah to start a Bible-believing work where God's people are. So remember, God in the last sermon will equip a man and prepare him with what he needs to succeed. And it's all over the story of this church here. You know, we never had much in terms of financial support. We never had the means, but somehow we got in a building like this. God gave us a way here. He paved the way. You know, sometimes you need to be you need to be observant about who God has called. Because you, you'll see God's hand at work every point in their life. And, and you might see God's hand at work in your life as well. Well, God gave me an opportunity to come to a Bible-believing church. He gave me this chance. He gave me this money so that I can afford to do this. And you see his hand everywhere. So here we see a man that's been called by God. He has a burden and he understands and recognizes a need for a Bible-believing work. But now here in chapter 2, the last half, he's facing the challenge. The title of this sermon is called Facing the Challenge. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just come before you and we ask that you would bless this sermon. Father, we pray that you would give this preacher out of the flesh, Lord. I want nothing to do with this in my flesh. I pray that this would just come straight from the word of God. And Father, I pray that you would deal with the hearts of the people here, Father. If there be any unclean or foul spirit amongst us, Lord, we pray that you cast that out. And Father, we pray that you would just... Soften the hearts of the people here, Lord. Uh, help them understand we're not here to uh, cast uh, shame. We're not here to uh, demean uh, anyone, Lord. We're simply here to preach the gospel and, Father, to be fed the word of God as the Bible is told us. In Jesus' name we pray that you bless this. Amen. Amen. So, there are many challenges you face in life. I mean, if you've been around the block, you've faced probably thousands of challenges in your life. You didn't know how you were going to get through and every time, somehow, you make it through. And if you're any wise, if you're wise, you'll understand that it's because of God's grace that you were able to get through. It's not because of this person. It's not because of what you have in your bank account that, that, that can, you can get through. It's not because of who you know. It's not because of where you live. It's because of God's grace that you were able to get through these challenges in life. 
And if you think it's because of you, you're taking glory from God. It's only because of God. Listen, God gave you the health. God gave you the means. God gave you the location. God gave you the relationships to get you through these problems. And if you don't think that God gave you those things, well, guess what? You can't blame God when he takes them from you. So there are many challenges we face in life. And let me tell you something. There's probably almost no greater challenge in this world that I can think of than starting and continuing a Bible-believing work in a, in a, in a, in a, a foul ground, rocky soil. See, you got to think about this. A, a church is like a plant. And Apostle Paul, he planted many churches in his day. And he always tried to keep up with them and tend to them and see what the condition of that plant was. Because when you're growing something, you need to be aware of the condition of the soil. You need to be aware of what kind of terrain it is. You need to be aware of what time of season it is. And the, the sooner you can start seeing things in terms of fruits and, and, and roots, the sooner right. you can start to see things the way God sees them. Because he sees us as roots. He sees us as plants. And he sees our production as fruit. And if a Bible-believing work is, or if a, if a church is not producing fruit, then guess what? Odds are, the roots is rotten. See? You need to be aware of the roots. If you want to know the root, you look at the what? The fruit. See? The Bible says, wherefore by their fruit ye shall know them. You know a Bible-believing church based off the fruit. Well, what are the fruit? You go to Galatians 5.22. You see all the fruit of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy, all that stuff. And it's spiritual. The fruit is not the building. This is not the fruit. All right, the fruit is not how many people we can get in the seats. The fruit of a Bible-believing church is how is it helping you in your family life? How is it helping you be a better brother? How is it helping you be a better mother, a better daughter, a better son? How is it helping you to be patient? How is it helping you to be long-suffering, loving, gentle, meek, kind? That's the fruit that God is looking for. See, and odds are, once you yoked up with a Bible-believing church, you may have started to see some confirmation of these things. You might have started to see that you have a target on your back now because the devil is trying to throw those fiery darts at your life, trying to get you to backslide, trying to get you out of that Bible-believing church because he knows that because you're coming here, you are becoming, in your heart, you're becoming closer to God. You're getting better fellowship with God. You're starting to walk with him and talk with him along life's narrow way. And the fruit of your life, the devil wants to hinder that. He wants to rock that fruit so that you don't do anything for Jesus Christ. So that's what we call negative confirmation. But it's not all negative. You see, you have positive confirmation as well. God will show you the fruit of following Jesus Christ in your life based off your relationships with other people. They'll start to notice things about you. Like, Since you start, I don't know what's different about you, but there's something different about you. I see it on your face. There's something different about you lately. What's your secret, man? Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> He has a good Popeye impression. <laughs> is Jesus Christ. You're right. Since Jesus got in my life, I'm a different person. I, I don't do the same things I did. I don't say the same things I used to say. I don't... I, I have conviction over sin. Amen. See? If you don't have those convictions, you need to be very careful. Listen, I don't... I, there's, a, there's a fine line we as Bible believers draw. We sometimes... We, we start to sometimes say that, oh, if you don't have conviction or if you don't, well, if you don't have uh, a change, if you don't change your actions, then you're not really saved. Listen, your salvation doesn't depend on anything you do. But if your actions, since you got saved, have not changed, if your attitude has not changed, you've got to check your heart because there is a chance. I'm not saying there's a 100% chance because I know that there's scenarios where this happens, but there is a chance you didn't get saved. You need to be sure of your salvation. The Bible says to make your calling and election sure. Make it sure. See? Because when, when you live, look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, the first assumption that's going to be made is, is that person really saved? Now, on the inverse side, of course none of these things will save. You can change all the sins in your life and you're still lost. Why? Because you haven't received Jesus Christ in your heart. Amen. In your heart. See? We need to ride that balance. It's not about, uh, it, 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 the Bible says a false balance is an abomination inside of God. So, where are we now? 
We have challenges in life. Challenges. And God is the one that's going to get you through it. Now starting here in verse 10, we're going to see the first challenge. And the first challenge of starting a Bible-believing work is surveying the area. Surveying the area. See here in verse 11. Or I'm sorry, verse 12. And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God hath put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. Okay, so the first thing you need to understand about surveying your area. Verse 12, notice how he didn't tell anyone what God put in his heart. He didn't tell anyone what God had put in his heart. The first thing you need to know about the challenge of surveying your area is the necessity of being covert. Covert. What's that mean, church? Covert means being stealthy. Covert means being in secret, hiding. Covert, like a covert operation. Governments do that all the time. And you need to realize that before you go and run your mouth and start saying all the things you're going to do and all, man, I'm here, I'm going to start a bible believing church, I'm going to have a church full of hundreds of people, and they're all going to get saved, there's going to be revival in Imperial Beach, people are going to get right to God, they're going to come back together, and we're just going to have a great old time. Before you start running your mouth, you probably should just check it out. You probably should just go and see things for yourself. You see, uh, <clears throat> Nehemiah was covert in his operation. Nehemiah had been in Jerusalem. Watch here in verse 10, or verse 11. It says, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. He was there three days before he decided, all right, let's see what else is around the block. And he was there three days. And I'm going to speculate here, okay? Because the, the text doesn't give me a lot to go off of in terms of what Nehemiah was thinking. But that's the fun thing about the Bible is the more you get into it, the more you get into the minds of the author, the more that you get into the mind of God. And you'd be surprised what wisdom you can glean if you simply put yourself in another person's shoes. You see, when you read the Bible, church, you don't just read it like you read a newspaper, okay? You read it, and you read it, and you put yourself in the text. You put yourself and think, what were they looking at? What were they feeling? How were they, what was on their mind at the time? And you get some perspective that you might not otherwise have gotten if you just simply read it as words. See, this is the mind of God. He recorded every word in this book for a reason. There's a reason that God mentioned something here. And the fun thing about reading your Bible is the mystery. What's the reason? Why, God, why did you put this there? Why did you mention this verse here? It seems so out of place, God, but you put it in here for a reason. And you pray to the Lord and ask Him, and, and, and He'll give you wisdom. And you might, you might be surprised when he shows you. So Nehemiah, he was there three days. And I speculate, the Jews that were there may have received them almost like royalty. Because why? He, he's the king's cupbearer. He's in direct uh, communication with the king. I, I speculate, and I could be wrong. That's why I tell you it's speculation. But I speculate, they may have just tried to show him all the nice parts of town. See, when you have company over, don't you, don't you just... Don't you clean up a little bit? Don't you tidy up? Don't you just try and make sure... You don't know, but you, I, most of you do. <laughs> don't you try and put on a good impression for these new visitors? See, that's why sometimes uh, bosses will show up unannounced so that they can see what things really go on when they're not around. See? I think Nehemiah, he waited three days because I'm not seeing it, man. Where is this burned down town? Where is all this stuff that... that that I heard about, that it's burned down without walls and without the gates. Now again, I'm, I'm speculating. I have to insert myself in the text, but this is what I see. So he waits three days, and then finally he goes out in the, in the dark of night. See here in verse 12, it says, I rose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do in Jerusalem. He doesn't want these people to know what he plans on doing for some reason. See? Uh, I, one reason I can think of is practically, you don't run your mouth and tell, make promises you can't keep. You don't just tell people, oh man, this is going to be great. Listen, I'm, I'm going to put you up in this hotel. I'm going to have you preach for me, brother. I'm going to give you $100 in gas and I'm going to feed you all this. And you're going to come preach for my church, man. And it's going to be great when I can't even afford to give you gas. Amen? Amen. Don't run your mouth too soon. Nehemiah went in secret. And he had something that God put in his heart. He didn't put this in his own heart. And listen, God sent him there. But he didn't just presume that God was just going to 
uh, all right, here's a million dollars, go get have at it. No, he surveyed the land. He checked it out. See, the next thing you need to understand about surveying the land. Actually, no, let me let me draw back. Let me draw back. Notice how he didn't tell people that God had put something in his heart. You see, sometimes we, uh, if you're a preacher or a pastor or a teacher, or, or if you're ever put in a position where you are a, a position of authority, sometimes we can let our authority get in our own head. Sometimes we can get puffed up and have pride about, like, saying, I'm the man of God around here. See? There, there's a thing called the man of God syndrome where, where sometimes preachers and pastors, they'll think because God put me here, you do what I say. They, primarily in the south. They all of a sudden think they're head honcho. And we're not, as a pastor, I'm not your overlord. I'm not your, I'm not your shepherd. I'm the under shepherd. I'm simply trying to handle what God has allowed me to handle. Right. See, it's ultimately, I can't force you to come here. I can't force you to read your Bible every day. I can't force you to pray every day. Listen, I'm not the man of your household. See, the moment you come here, all right, that's when God, God allows me to have authority to say, this is how we're going to do things. This is where the church is going. But the moment you step out of that building, I'm not, your, I'm not the one that's in charge of you guys. I can't be the one that's just going to say, listen, this is, how, this is how long your skirt has to be when you come to this church. I can't be that way. All right? I can't tell you, listen, you, you have to wear a tie when you come to church. Listen, there's certain boundaries I can't cross as a pastor. Nehemiah, he was humble. He didn't just come and say, I'm the man of God, I'm here to build this city. He didn't say it. He just checked it out. You see? You can't have that man of God syndrome. If, you're the ones to, if you have to say you're the boss, odds are you're not the boss. See? There's a difference between bosses and leaders. There's a difference between bosses and leaders. You see, a boss, I'm trying to remember this, from, uh, keep this in my memory. <clears throat> a boss says, go. A leader says, let's go. A boss says, I. A leader says, we. Okay? A boss gives out, uh, a, a boss puts the responsibility on others. A leader takes the responsibility upon, upon himself. See, a boss sits in the back. A leader shows you the way. See, you need to understand the difference between the two because sometimes they look similar. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower once said that the art of leadership, and if you're a, if you're a business owner or if you've ever thought about it or if you're, a household, uh, if you're in a household and you're the leader, this is going to be helpful to you. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower once said that the art of leadership is getting a person to do something you want done because they want to do it. Amen. Think about that. See, if I have to tell you to do something and you don't want to do it, I've already told you to do it. See, I, I should, sometimes I'll be a secret parent but they're not going to want to do it because they're not mature enough. But, listen, you guys are great because I'm not trying to help you up. You want to help. You want to contribute. You want to do more. You want something to do. That's, that's amazing to me. That's a, that's a blessing from God that you want to do something. If I ask someone, listen, I need help stamping tracks. I got like 10 hands. I want to. I want to. Imagine being a business owner and people say, oh, please, Angel, can I, can I scrub the grout? Please? Ray, can we change your tires? No. <laughs> just preach. <just> Leave <laughs> my car alone. See Having that good leadership requires that bird's eye view of just seeing like, okay, how can I, how can I inspire someone Amen. to want to do something? And we're going to see how Nehemiah does it later. Sure. But just, just keep that in mind. There's a difference between bosses and leaders. The boss is typically the one that's saying, I'm the boss, I'm the boss, I'm the boss. You do what I say when you come in this church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> the leader says, the leader is completely different. The leader will inspire you, and he will be an example for you to follow. And not only that, you're going to want to follow this guy. Why? Because he's following the leader. We're all following the leader, amen? If you're doing it right, you're following Jesus Christ. And, God, and Jesus Christ, God is going to put someone in your life that is following him. And it's your job to seek that person out and follow the leader. So, Nehemiah... He had the challenge of surveying his area. He needed to see what he had to work up against. 
And the next thing, uh, the next step involving the challenges remaining in the area is one, be covert. Two, be sure to check things out yourself. I, like I said, practical advice, don't just take people's words for it. For it. You know, he heard from these Jews that came in from out of town, listen, uh, Jerusalem, the gates are burnt down, the gates are torn down, things are bad, man, we have adversaries on every side, and Nehemiah was so overwrought, he's just, oh God, oh God, please help my people. But he didn't just take their words at face value, he went to go check things out and make sure what the things were said and saw. You see, because you make a fool out of yourself when you assume things, and you don't check it out for yourself. You need to be sure of what these things are said or so. Nehemiah checked things out for himself. See? Sometimes the, the best places you've ever been to, they always have the negative Yelp review. Have you noticed that? Yeah. You know, those holes in the walls? Oh, the seats were... They, they're old and it's dirty, but the food is so good. Yes, sir. See? Uh, I think the devil puts out those Yelp reviewers sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got business owners here. You probably know about those people, you know? And you know what? Let them let them talk. See, go check things out for yourself. See if those reviews are lying. So, Nehemiah, the man of God, he took the time to see what he was up against. You sometimes as Bible believers, if you're on fire for the Lord, you want to do so much, and we you want to just go out and be an evangelist, I'm gonna go lose my life for the Lord. I'm like, come on, man, take some steps first, alright? Don't be a martyr all of a sudden. See, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 28, uh, you find it? I'm sorry, Luke 14, 28. Jesus said this. Luke 14, 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? You see, don't take on unrealistic building projects, all right? God told Noah to build an ark. He also gave him the means to build it, amen? You, you, don't, you don't take on unrealistic building projects in your life and just hope that, oh, I hope it works out. You take it step, first step at a time, one step after the next step, and you get those little goals in mind, and it should pile up to that big goal that you want. I want a house, okay? Well, how, what about the little steps you take? All right, save some money here. Let's try, a, let's try a thousand every two months or something like that. Whatever's realistic in your own mind. We need to consider the cost when it comes to starting something for the Lord. All right? Some of you may have a family and you can't go and be a missionary to China quite that easily. Some of you have health problems and you can't go and, and get in a... <laughs> And getting the spiritual war uh, out there in the front lines, expecting to survive. Some of you need to consider the cost. Nehemiah observed the extent of the damages here in verse 13 and 15. Watch. And I went out by the night, by night, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well into the dung court, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. So when Nehemiah is doing he's late at night, he's looking around the town. He's looking around Jerusalem, and Jerusalem has these gates, all right? And he's at the south side, the valley gate. That's the south side of Jerusalem. Next to it is the dung port, and you have, and, and you learn what all these gates mean and what they signify. The valley sim symbolizes, I've, I've, I've learned to be uh, hell. Um, but the thing that's important about this is Nehemiah went to take the time to go check these things out. And you see what needs to get built before he goes and talks to the people about it. See, before you make plans in your life to go do something for the Lord, you better be sure that God has equipped you, prepared you, helped you to recognize the need. And then you go get your feet on the ground, boots on the ground, at ground zero, and see, okay, what am I going to do? What's the challenge that's facing me now? Christian, what are the challenges in your life you're facing right now? Maybe you have family issues. Maybe you have relationship struggles. Maybe you have health issues. Maybe you have spiritual problems. But I guarantee you one thing. If you consider the challenge and you see what Jesus Christ has done to get you through it, you probably wouldn't be as in much dire straits as you are now. You need to consider the cost. Face the challenge. 
You won't get anything done if you turn away from it. So Nehemiah observed the extent of the damage done to Jerusalem. And watch here in verse 16. So he was checking things out for himself. But verse 16, And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews. <coughs> Nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did work, did to work. So Nehemiah, he took the time to survey the land, and check things out, see what the damage was. And he just sat there. Didn't tell anyone. Didn't say, hey, listen, man, what's going on here? Who, who, let, these, who let things get like this? Whoa. How long has it been this way? He just let it sit. And he was contemplating. He just sat there. Ruminating, thinking, what? How am I going to do this? Lord, I need your help. It doesn't, say, it doesn't tell you what he was thinking about, but this is what I think he was thinking about. I think he was praying to God, listen, God, I need wisdom. I need understanding. I need a plan, Father. I need something to tell these people about the condition of, their, of, of Jerusalem, of the, of the capital. And I need us to get rallied together as one cohesive unit, Father. And I think he was just thinking about that all night. Praying about it. Chewing on it. Picturing in his head. He, his horse couldn't even get to the king's uh, pool. See? All he, could, he, he couldn't even get past this rubble. What, what problems are you facing in your life that you don't even know how, what you're going to do? Maybe some of you are facing financial struggles. I don't know, Father. I don't know how I'm going to pay bills. I don't know how I'm going to get this, uh, <clears throat> get through this. It's important to take that time and just, instead of talking to each other about it, talk to the, talk to the Lord. Amen. Be contemplative. Sit there. Meditate on it. It's good for you, man. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we just like to talk. Just keep it to yourself for a while. You'd be surprised at the wisdom God shows you. So, the first challenge is surveying the area. The second challenge is stirring your allies. Stirring your allies. Uh, if you're a business owner, you came to the right service because this is going to help you as a business owner, as a family person, as a leader. Because these are challenges you face in life. You face these challenges on the area, on, the, on your allies, on your workers, on the people that you have to lead. And Nehemiah had to stir these allies up. You see, the first thing that it comes to us uh, the first thing necessary for stirring your allies is what we just read, is getting a lay of the land. Know, your, know where you're at. See, verse 16 to 17, uh, he didn't tell anyone. He just sat there and, 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 and was contemplating. And then he started to speak to them. But he got a lay of the land first before he addressed the people. See, <clears throat> All the time Nehemiah spent surveying was meant to give him a clearer perspective on the challenge at hand. See, if you just go things into things blindly, you're going to lose your head, man. You're going to take on challenges that you've got no business taking on. You're going to take on unrealistic building projects. You're going to get yourself into some legal issues that you probably could have avoided if you simply waited. And... Sometimes you take that attitude to church where you just feel like things aren't growing how I want it to. I want to rush things. Don't rush things here. Sometimes you can feel angry towards the pastor or towards whoever has put, God has put in charge of you in certain areas of your life. And sometimes you'll start to pin the blame on him saying, well, how come things aren't going out how I want them to turn out? How come you're not using me the way I want to be used? Listen, God is going to put... Put that on the pastor's heart, or on, the, on your boss's heart, as long as you keep serving the Lord and be pleasing in his eyes. See, the Bible says, I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't have it down to memory, but if a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies would be at peace with him. How much more so for the person that's your boss? See, if you're pleasing God, I think your boss might take notice. So, <clears throat> just be aware that things be a, Behind the surface, behind the, behind closed doors, there's things happening behind closed doors that you have no idea about. See, sometimes we can't just go out there and change the world, turn the world upside down as a church until things are right here, until things are right in here. 
See? And we as Bible believers, sometimes we get so, we want to do so much for God, but our houses aren't even right inside. We want to do so much for the Lord, but God hasn't equipped us or prepared us or helped us to recognize the need in our lives like he did with Nehemiah. Sometimes all we have is that burden, but we're still stuck there. God hasn't opened the door for you yet. What do you do then, Christian? Do you just go and do what you want? Or do you just simply sit under authority, under the king, and wait until God gives you the go ahead? This is hard preaching for some people. Because we have our own plans in mind. We have our own objectives and our own goals, but we don't try to see things through the lens of what God is looking at. See, God doesn't want renegades. He doesn't want lone wolves. He doesn't want people to go and just make a fool of themselves for the cause of Christ. See, if you're doing it right, God will approve it. But we, it's not, we can't take that on ourselves. God has to be the one that gives us the opportunity. And that's what he gave Nehemiah. Don't be so quick to go do something if you're not prepared to do it. That's the point. The Bible says that if, you ha if you're hasting with your feet, you're sinning. See, it's a sin to be too in a rush. It's a sin. So, Nehemiah took the time and he got to see Jerusalem how they saw it. Not how they wanted him to see it. Now, the thing about stirring your allies, number one, it requires a lay of the land. Number two, it requires a simple plan. A simple plan. Watch here in verse 17. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, and how Jerusalem lies waste. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more of reproach. You see, Nehemiah had simple plans. All right, let's build a wall. You know, that wasn't the goal, though. The goal was not to build the wall. That was the means for the goal. The goal, if you read verse 18, 17, is that Jerusalem would be no more a reproach. You see, we have these intangible goals in our minds, all right? The, I know, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little while, but you need to get this. What do people want in life? That's not a trick question. What do people want? Right, but why? Why do people want money? Why do people want security? See, ultimately, people want happiness. People want to be content. See, the building the wall was not the main goal. Of the, that was the means to the goal. They wanted something intangible. See, I want happiness. That's an intangible. How do I get happiness? Well, I want a house. I want a life. I want money. I want this. It's the tangible things that we attribute to the intangible. And I'm not saying that's always wrong. I think, listen, money can't buy happiness. But man, it comes close. <laughs> it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? See, but... The building the wall was something that would bring, take the reproach off of Jerusalem. See? You need to know what your plan is. It was a simple plan. Build the wall. And they got something intangible out of that. They got a goal that they couldn't just, I can't go to the store and buy happiness. Right? I can buy a chocolate cake and that's close, but that's about it. I can't, I can't go, buy, go to the store and buy a piece. See? Maybe you can go to the pot shop, but that's <laughs> that's part of my question. That's simple. Here's the thing. Is you start with the simple stuff. You start small. You start with a plain, simple plan. Build the wall. And when you come together as a church, when we come together and have a simple plan, build this wall, guess what? Things will start to come together. It's through the simple things. Don't complicate it, Christian. Don't get things, oh, oh well, we're going to build the wall. We're also going to start, and we're going to build a parking lot. It's going to be great. And, man, oh, wait till I, you haven't even heard my idea about when we're going to make the, uh, 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 the second story addition, you know. And you start to add on all these things to the project that, dude, just start simple. Build the wall. What are you doing trying to add so much stuff? Oh, Pastor, I think it would be great if we had a, 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 a surfboard ministry. We would go minister to surfing the surfers out there. Don't complicate it. Let's just build, focus on building this before we go and try to change the world. Amen? So it requires a simple plan. And it also requires a God-called man. Like I said, Nehemiah was clearly called by God. You better be sure that the person you're following is, is called by God. See, how do I know if a person's called by God? He preaches from the right Bible. 
He preaches the right doctrine. He has the fruit of the Spirit. All right, I'm not, I'm not saying this about myself. I'm saying this about everyone. You better be sure you're following the right man if you're following him. So make sure that he's called by God. Make sure he has the fruit in his life. Not the fruit like a building. I'm talking spiritual, inwards. See, is he gentle? Is he meek? Is he mild? Is he, is he humble? Is he, uh, does he stand on the right doctrine? You've got to be sure of that. And guess what? These people recognize that in Nehemiah. Verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was uh, good upon me, as also the king's words, that he has spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build, so they strengthen their hands for this good work. You see, the people were, were inspired by Nehemiah. They were inspired. See, Nehemiah didn't tell them to strengthen their hands. Nehemiah didn't tell them. They said, let us rise up and build. So the ball's in your court, in your court church. Are we going to rise up and build something? I, I, can't, I can't put this on you. This is going to be to something you put on yourself. I want to do something for the cause of Christ. I want to do something that comes to building this church. And I thank God for you guys that you wanted to contribute. But just remember that. Keep this in memory of this passage that you have to be the one to say, let us build up. And you're the ones that are going to have to strengthen your hands when it comes to building. Where do we find strength in the time of need, Christians? Jesus Christ. Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ with strength. You're not going to be able to do this on your own flesh. See, you're going to have troubles in your family life. You're going to have troubles in your financial life, in your, in your work life. And Jesus Christ is the one that's going to have to strengthen you to get through it. I'm moving along. Don't worry. Last thing, the last challenge. So, number one challenge, the challenge of surveying your area. Second challenge, the challenge of stirring your allies. The last challenge, and this one's going to help you probably almost more than anything else, is standing up to your adversaries. Amen. You know, it's not all fun and games. Raise your hand if you've ever had to face a lawsuit before. <laughs> you got adversaries, don't you? It's scary. When legal troubles come, you could be innocent as, as the day is light. And you're still worried about it. See, you have adversaries that are actively seeking your destruction. And they're looking for you. Alright? It might not be that, it might not be the mailman. All right? it, not, it might not be uh, that lady at the grocery store that hates your guts. It might be the television in your home. It might be that phone in your hand when you're looking at Instagram late at night and you don't even know uh, what the next clip is going to be and all of a sudden you see something that just completely gets you in the flesh. You don't know what it can be. But you will have a target on your back and you have an adversary that is actively seeking to destroy you. It might be the flesh. It might be the pressures of this world. But there's something in this world that is your adversary that God expects you to stand up against. You got to stand up against it. You can't be afraid. You can't be fearful. Watch here in verse 19. After Nehemiah has stirred up his allies, after they had gotten their spirits up, guess what? The devil always sends someone to just rain on their parade. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? So I want to bring to your attention three means by which the adversary will attack you and three things that you have to stand up against and then we'll be done. The, third, the first thing that you have to stand up against is the enemy is their insult. Their insults. See, the world's first line of attack is to mock you. You see it all the time in liberal mainstream news. You see it all the time when you go out street preaching. You'll see people flipping you off and making fun of you and mocking you. And if you are weak mentally, that's going to get to you. <coughs> that's going to start to discourage you. Like, I don't want to go out there anymore. They're mean. They make fun of me. And listen, listen, I don't like it either. At least I used to know. Now I kind of like it. Do I hear like that? I like it. I don't know. <clears throat> you see it on the internet comments all the time. The, there's never, almost never a good time to write a comment on the internet. 
It's, it's never edifying. It's never good. And we still do it because we always want to chime in. We always want to, oh, you know, you're wrong. You're dumb because you said this. I get it, man. See, you need to realize that the enemy will try and discourage you from doing what's right. And he'll mock you to do it. You need to stand up against those insults. What well, kids, I hope your parents taught you this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. All right, maybe that's, maybe that's like old school, but sticks and stones, man. What, what are their words going to do to you? Nothing. It's when you let it do something to you. See, I, I, let's get a little bit, uh, <laughs> let's get a little practical here. Raise your hand if you weren't the popular kid in high school. All right, weren't popular. It's okay if you were popular, if you weren't popular. It's okay if you were if you were popular, Wait, all right. Did you say weren't? Raise your hand if you weren't popular, all right. I learned pretty quickly. You can put your hand down now, brother. You, don't worry, you're popular here. <laughs> I learned. I don't know. I'm not telling you it's good, but I kind of like not being popular. I kind of like it. I kind of like just not caring about them. What, what other people thought. And when it came to peer pressure, I was like, why are you guys trying to, people? they would invite me to go drink, like, no, that's stupid, why would I do that? And I almost thought, like, it was just like, why would you do that? But it was popular to go out and drink and after, after school and all that stuff. And I almost thought, like, why would I want to be part of the majority? It was almost like a prideful thing, which is why I don't completely advise for it. But just listen, man. Why, why don't you like it? Because you like it. See, that's it. It's just that simple. I just want to do it. I just don't want to do it because you want to do it. See, it's almost adversarial, but you have an adversary. See, how come you don't want to go to the bar after work? Because you guys want to go. I don't want to be popular. Forget you guys. How come you go to church every Sunday? Because you don't. Just to, just to get in your skin. Just to get in your craw. I just want to be different from you. That's it. See? But I like that, man. I like having that, that attitude towards the world. See, because why? That's the world that crucified your Messiah, your Savior. You should have a little attitude against the world. Listen, they're not your, the, the world is not your friend. The world will try and convince you, oh, no, man, it's all cool. You know, let's all get along. Let's coexist, man. <laughs> no, let's not. I'm not going to do the things you do. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to smoke the things you smoke. I'm not going to drink the things you drink. I'm not going to say the things you say. I'm not going to watch the things you watch. Why, man? Because you like it. Because Jesus Christ is inside it. Amen? Jesus Christ said, if the world hates you, he it hated me first. The world hates Jesus Christ. What do I have to fellowship with the world that hates my God? They're not my friends. I, I want them saved. I want them here to get saved. But when it comes to what they do and what they tolerate, I don't want anything to do with that. So you need to stand up against their insult. You need to stand up against their ill will. It said, it said right here in verse 19, they despised us. Why? Because they despised Jesus Christ. The world will let you know how much it hates you. And if there's one thing that a person hates, it's the fear of public opinion. You need to stop caring what other people think of you, Christian. You're not cool, all right? You never were cool, amen? You never were popular. Get used to it, all right? All those years of being unsuccessful in high school was just preparing me for the ministry, amen? Amen. Amen, man. Amen. God uses the rejects. Praise God. God Preach. uses the base things of this world. God doesn't want to use the Bill Gates or the people with the money or the people that are cool, the Elon Musk. He wants to use the base things, the people that can't even write English well, the people that can't even, that can barely read. He wants to use those things because then he knows you're not going to take the credit. There was a, a business leader that said, you'd be surprised what can get done in businesses if it doesn't matter who takes the credit. See, if you're not looking to get the credit, you'd be surprised how much things will go your way. Why? Because you're not trying to exalt yourself. Hey, they want to take the credit even though they didn't do it? Whatever. As long as it's done. I don't want the credit. I just want this business to prosper. I just want our household to prosper. You know, sometimes as a, as a husband or as a wife, you feel like, oh, man, I just want I, How come he never acknowledges me? Or how come she never says good job or something like that? Just let them have it. Just, it doesn't, it's not about you. And you'd be surprised how easy those relationships can go if you don't take the credit. 
All right, let's wrap things up here. So the challenge of standing up to your adversaries involves standing up against insults, standing up against ill will, and then standing up against intimidation. All right, verse 20, or 19, they laughed at us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Well, you need to know this, that Nehemiah got permission from the king. He was allowed to be there. But sometimes the adversary will try and threaten you with legal issues. Sometimes they'll try and threaten you with uh, physical harm or, or anything like that. And you need to not back down when the enemy is threatening you. There's nine, 99 times out of 100, those things are baseless. Those things are false, are, are, are empty threats. The devil will try and threaten you to keep you from doing this right. Don't be threatened, Christian. We're going to see some things pretty soon with the whole COVID 2.0. And you're going to see that Christians are going to get persecuted. And then they're going to say, shut down the churches just like before. They're going to say, don't come to church. You know, you can't meet. You have to put on masks when you come to church. You can't worship God unless we tell you to put on a mask. Don't listen to that. Don't, don't follow their, their threats. Peter once said, we ought uh, better to obey God. See, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Don't, don't be afraid of what man can do. Be afraid of what God can do to you. See? Because God is the one that holds the key. God is the one that holds it all in his hands. And now that you've faced the challenge, just, just remind yourself. It might seem steep. It might seem tough. But what did Nehemiah say in verse 20? Then answered I them. And I imagine he did it like this. Very firm. I, I imagine he was like, oh, you got a problem with that? Let me show you something. Let me show you the word of God real quick. The God of heaven, will he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. And ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. What did he say? He dug his feet in the ground. He drew the line in the sand and says, let's go. I'm up for the challenge. Are you? Let's pray.